I would like to hand over to Gopal for his opening remarks. Over to you, Gopal. Gopal, you're muted. Can you hear me now? Yeah, can you hear me now? Yeah, I think it was, it was, it was, I was muted from the back. Okay. Uh, so thank you, Komal. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, thank you for joining us today for this webinar to discuss our results for the second quarter ended 30th September 2020, which we announced yesterday. Uh, present with me on this webinar today are Badal, Harjit, Nakul, and Komal. Uh, last month marked the 25th year anniversary for Bharti Airtel. Uh, it has indeed been a very eventful journey from laying a strong foundation in telecom in the early years to rapid growth and now to the shift of us becoming a powerful digital services provider. This year in particular has been truly unprecedented. The outbreak of COVID earlier in the year changed everything. Yet we continue to serve our customers and the nation brilliantly. I am particularly proud of how our teams went above and beyond the call of duty to serve our customers. The real reason we were able to recover so quickly was because of our people and our investments in digital over the last few years. We were able to respond with agility, reorient many parts of our business model, and focus on what matters, serving our customers. This is why our performance in the quarter was strong. We showed healthy growth across revenues, margins, and customers. Our consolidated revenues, grew sequentially by 7.7%, while the India business grew by 6.6% in a quarter that is normally weak because of seasonality. Growth was broad-based across the portfolio, though the star segment was mobility at a growth of 7.4%. With operating leverage also kicking in, we reported an overall EBITDA margin of 46%. Let me now turn to each of our business segments, and let me start with our homes business. I believe that the broadband category is at a cusp in terms of growth. With COVID as the trigger point, we're seeing an increase in work from home, in online education, and in streaming services. All of these need reliable high-speed broadband. We are therefore doubling down on broadband through four, uh, four approaches or four things. First is the rapid expansion of our own coverage. We added 1 million home passes in the cities during the quarter that is in the cities we are present in. Second, the acceleration of our LCO partnership model. During the quarter, we expanded to 29 new cities. Third, bringing the full power of Airtel services, as well as our partner services, to deliver an integrated, converged offer, encompassing connectivity, entertainment, and more. Our Airtel Extreme bundle now combines the power of Airtel Extreme fiber, unlimited data, the first of its kind Airtel Extreme Android 4K TV box and access to an intuitive customer face, which is delivered seamlessly across screens. Finally, an adjustment in entry prices due to competitive reasons towards the end of the quarter. As a result, we saw growing momentum across the quarter while adding close to 130,000 net ads in this business. Our DTH business added 549,000 customers in the quarter. One of the reasons for acceleration has been the distribution synergy we were able to get through leveraging the larger mobility sales infrastructure. We're now doubling down on this capability. Let me now turn to Airtel Business, uh, which as a segment grew by 2.3%. I believe this is one business that has incredible promise and the growth of this business, as I've said before, is frankly limited by our own imagination. When we talk to our enterprise customers, we hear them asking us for three things. The first thing they ask us is to ensure that we raise the quality of our services, strengthen network resilience for them, while helping them bring down their cost. To meet this ask, we added almost 7.6 terabits of capacity in our transport network. While this serves all our needs across homes, mobility, and enterprise, we are one of the few players that can do this so efficiently. We also made investments in strengthening customer experience, 
to the launch of the state-of-the-art workforce management solution, which is a platform that handles customer complaints while moving hundreds of enterprise connectivity links to a highly resilient MPLS backbone. To help lower costs, we launched several solutions. Airtel Work at Home, that meets all the B2B needs of employees working from home. Airtel Blue Jeans offers a reliable, secure way to have meetings wherever your employee or customer is. Airtel Office in a Box is our effort to provide a single touch, seamless and holistic service to help startups and companies seeking to enter India for the first time. We also launched Airtel Cloud by signing a multi-year strategic collaboration agreement with AWS, Amazon Web Services, to deliver a comprehensive set of cloud solutions to customers in India. This collaboration brings AWS, the world's leading cloud platform, together with Airtel's deep reach and proven expertise in handling network, data centers, security, and cloud as an integrated solution. We also have a rapidly growing Nextra, our data center business, that allows customers to store their data in India. Each of these products lower costs for our customers, take away the hassle of dealing with multiple partners, and meet the gold standards of security and reliability that matters to our customers. The second thing our customers ask us is to help them engage digitally with their customers so that they can serve them better or get more growth. Our launch of Airtel IQ earlier this week is the first step in meeting this need. Airtel IQ is a cloud-based omni-channel customer relationship management platform. This product helps our customers engage with their customers with their customers in a safe, secure manner across multiple channels, be it voice, SMS, or increasingly video. So whether it's a consumer ordering food through Swiggy and then tracking her order by calling the delivery agent, or a customer arranging for a blood sample collection from Lal Path Labs, or indeed one of India's largest banks, enabling their advisors to speak to their customers from a remote location, the entire communication gets orchestrated over Airtel IQ in a seamless, secure, and reliable manner all over the cloud. Many of India's biggest brands are already on Airtel IQ. We believe that with Airtel IQ, we are well positioned to become a major player in the billion dollar cloud communication market that is growing rapidly. You will see more and more innovation from us on Airtel IQ over the coming months. The third thing our customers ask us is to help them protect their data and information from the increased cybersecurity threats that everyone faces today. Airtel Secure does exactly that. Airtel Secure is a comprehensive suite of advanced cybersecurity solutions that has been built through the power of best of breed partnerships. Our partners here include global leaders in their respective domains, Cisco, Radware, VMware, and Forcepoint. In addition, we have made a substantial investment in building a world-class security intelligence center, which uses AI and machine learning to do real-time monitoring of security threats across all business applications. So our strategy in B2B is no different from the overall Airtel strategy. We will simply leverage our strengths to provide solutions to our customers, either through building products ourselves or through world-class partnerships in order to meet the digital needs of our customers. Let me now turn to the star segment of the quarter, mobile. Our revenues grew by 955 crores, a sequential growth of 7.4%, which enabled us to expand our EBITDA margins by 2%. This performance was on the back of strong 4G net ads at 14.4 million. In fact, over the last four quarters, we've added 50 million 4G customers on our network. We also added 700,000 net ads in the postpaid segment, which was one of our strongest performances in recent times. Our customer net ads, overall customer net ads, was at 13.9 million, and our churn was at an all-time low of 1.7%. Most heartening was that ARPU also moved up from 157 rupees to 162 rupees. We believe our strategy of being relentlessly focused on winning quality customers is paying off. Our brand is the most aspirational and trusted brand in the country. Our experience is decidedly the best in the country. In fact, we are consistently seen as the best network by independent global tests and have won several awards. Best network for gaming, best network for video experience, lowest latency and fastest downloads. For every discerning customer in India, this truly matters. Experience for us, for us is the cornerstone of our strategy. 
We therefore continue to invest in experience. Last quarter, we added 5,047 sites. With this, we are now at above 200,000 physical sites. We've also ramped up densification of our networks through solutions such as adding sectors, adding twin beams, refarming our spectrum, experimenting with features that enhance spectral efficiency, and adding massive MIMOs. Our voice over Wi-Fi solution is now being used by around 13 million customers who've seen a significant improvement in their indoor coverage. We've invested in several tools in our state-of-the-art network operating center at Manisa that's allows, allowing us to diagnose and fix problems in a very granular and real-time manner. Our entire company is unified by a single purpose, to deliver a superior experience. One of the important milestones we delivered was the launch of our high-speed 4G services in Andaman and Nicobar with the commissioning of the submarine optical cable fiber project. Today, our networks are increasingly future ready. We are one of the leading players in the open RAN effort. In fact, during the quarter, we hosted the global ORAN PlugFest event, the first of its kind event in India for demonstration of interoperability of open interfaces as defined by the ORAN Alliance. The quarter also saw our first field deployments of the ORAN-based outdoor small cell, which has been designed by our in-house R&D team and supported by several partners. Let me now turn to the digital capabilities we are building. These capabilities are allowing us to do three very powerful things. First, they allow us to acquire quality customers. Second, they allow us to drive greater share of wallet and reduce churn, both of which enhance lifetime value of the customer. Third, they allow us to eliminate waste. This is what digital means for us. And we believe this is now impacting our business materially and building what I would call a virtual flywheel. The first element of this flywheel is the impact on the core business. Today, 50% of our business is now online. More than 40% of our high value customer acquisitions are now omni-channel, ordered online and delivered straight to the home. Every customer journey is being reimagined and delivered in an omni-channel way. And our faults are down by over 50% in the last year, saving us substantial cost. So this is the first element of the flywheel, which is the impact on the core. The second element of this flywheel is the strengths that we've been able to extract and build out digitally. And we have referred to them earlier. We have four strengths. First is data. Today, in addition to our customer base of 294 million mobile customers, 20 million homes, and a million offices, we already have 160 million monthly active users engaged on our digital assets. Wink is the most popular music app at 59 million. Airtel Thanks is one of the most powerful digital assets with over 82 million monthly active users. The data provided by this scale is incredible and allows us to make personalized recommendations. Second, payments. Our Mitra app is now used by over 1 million retailers to collect cash and perform transactions across mobile, the bank, and soon for DTH. Our payments bank is already at 2.5 billion US dollar monthly throughput and growing. This scale allows us to engage our customers and fulfill transactions end to end. Customers will soon be able to make payments online, add our stores, or simply add their service to the bill. This is a priceless capability. Therefore, whether it's our own services or allying with partners to distribute their services, it is this payments capability that allows us to close the loop from engagement to purchase. Third, distribution. The access to our 294 million customers, 160 million digitally engaged customers, 20 million homes, and a million offices is a scale that is unique. The fact that these customers are the best customers today makes it even more attractive. Finally, network, which allows us to identify the location, expose APIs, and provide value-added services where relevant. Airtel IQ leverages this network strength and therefore, it is precisely through this capability that Airtel IQ has been built by our software teams. The third element of this flywheel is partnerships. We have a model of partnerships that we have referred to before, which follows a powerful concept that is working for us. And it's quite simple, it's called T. T is for transparent commercials, which is what a partner likes. E is for ease of integration, and this is very important to a partner. 
is for accelerated adoption and discovery of partner services on our platform. And M is for mutual growth. This concept has now been created into APIs and a model that allows for easy plug and play. You will see that much of these capabilities are now translating to differentiated products and services that solve real customer problems. Airtel IQ, Airtel Secure, and Airtel Blue Jeans have all been launched in the last few months. Our ad tech platform is in beta testing. We're gradually beginning to scale our partnerships on selling financial services like insurance as well as content. Every one of these services are developed at almost no capex. They simply ride on the underlying strengths that we've built and are being delivered through the tremendous digital talent base of 1,500 people we now have in-house. Going forward, you will see us building this ever more powerfully. In sum, the last quarter has been eventful. Our strategy remains the same. Win quality customers by giving them an exceptional experience. Do this by building an aspirational brand and do it all in an efficient way. Finally, wrap everything we do through digital, omni-channel and with scale. As we do this, deliver meaningful services, both our own as well as partner services. Thank you. And with that, I hand, uh, hand it back to Koma. Thank you, Gopal. Uh, the first question comes from Susmit Patodia. He wants to understand what is the precursor in terms of competitive outlay and economic environment for a tariff hike from here on? I think the, uh, the you know, the firstly, if I step back, uh, we've always said that uh, the ARPU that we have today in the industry is extremely low for the amount of uh, allowances that we provide for the ARPU. Um, at 160 odd rupees, if you can get as much data as you need, unlimited calling and some content, that's really uh, an extremely low level of pricing. So we do believe that ARPU, as we've said, must go to 200 and finally uh, to 300 rupees. But it is a question really of not whether customers can afford to pay, uh, because many customers at the uh, upper end of the spectrum can certainly afford to pay a lot more. But the question is the competitive dynamic and the competitive readiness to take a tariff increase. And I think I would hope that uh, that that would happen at some point, but I'm not a soothsayer, so I can't tell you when it will happen. But I can tell you that at these levels of tariff, uh, it's not a sustainable situation from a long term uh, as far as the industry is concerned. So if somebody will have to lead it. We are already at a premium. In fact, we have signaled that we want tariffs to go up. We are therefore at a premium already, and we'll be happy to follow the same day if uh, tariffs were to go up further. Thanks, Kupal. Uh, the next question is from Parag Gupta. Parag wants to know what kind of growth can we see in the homes business from here on, and any goals on subscriber-based revenue cities that we can provide? Uh, in which business, Komal? In the homes, homes business. The homes yeah. business. Uh, well, we don't give guidance, but I, I, I can kind of briefly tell you what we're trying to do on homes. I think, like I said, uh, we have seen a surge in home broadband uh, arising out of all of the factors that I've already mentioned. Um, work from home, uh, the streaming, growth in streaming, online education, as also price correction or a price reduction in the broadband segment. Uh, this entire price reduction is not yet factored in in the quarter because that happened towards September. So you'll see that all flow through only in the next quarter. But what I can tell you is that we're seeing traction in broadband. The 129,000 customers that we added, uh, September was a, was a, was a, uh, a record month uh, for, uh, that we've seen over several, several quarters. Um, what are we doing right now? I think we're doing two things. One is that we are rapidly expanding in the cities that we're present in. So in this quarter, we rolled out a million home passes, which is amongst the highest that we've seen uh, in, in any quarter. And secondly, we are also, we have perfected the LCO model. Uh, this model was, uh, you know, tested for almost seven, eight months using four or five different approaches in four or five different cities. Uh, we've got it right, and now we're beginning to scale it. Uh, so we're already in 48 towns. Uh, we rolled out 29 more towns this quarter, and we will continue to drive this uh, uh, rapidly to expand home broadband. Sure. Thanks, Kupal. Uh, the next set of questions is from Eric Liu. 
Eric wants to understand what is the reason for the sudden increase in net debt quarter on quarter. I'll request Harjit to take that. And secondly, if there is any change in our CAPEX guidance for the year or our CAPEX run rate for the year. Harjit, can I request oh, I you to take the question? I can take this. Yeah, I can take the second question yeah. and then I'll hand over to Harjit. Um, on the CAPEX uh, side, I think we don't give guidances, uh, but you would, you would see us, um, you know, if you take the first quarter, the CAPEX was quite modest because of uh, lockdowns and uh, our inability to move equipment. Uh, the second quarter was, uh, was increased uh, primarily because we caught up with what we could do. Plus, we saw a massive surge in data as people worked from home. And I think that we will continue to see uh, CapEx being deployed in order to deliver a, a really good experience. I think that really matters. Um, we are expanding some of our coverage through physical sites as also bolstering capacity. Uh, what we've also said is that the peak levels of CapEx that we saw uh, for HL are now behind us. So we are unlikely to see those levels of CapEx, but CapEx will continue to uh, inform the experience we're able to deliver. Arjit, uh, you can take the net debt one. Yeah, no, thanks, Kupal. Uh, no, I think the net debt one is uh, specifically linked to the AGR final judgment and bulk of the, in fact, the entire dominant increase is on account of final AGR numbers and the uh, Supreme Court order. All of the AGR liability has been accounted for. Operationally, though, the business, as per earlier expectations, across Infratel Africa and in India also, uh, continues to be free cash flow positive. Over the last two quarters, uh, between these three segments, there is uh, close to about three to four thousand crores of free cash flow generation. Uh, so operationally, continues to be positive. The AGR recognition of the final numbers is what you are seeing as a net debt movement. Thanks, Ajit. Uh, the next set of questions is from Kunal Vora. Kunal wants to know what is the impact of Geo's new postpaid plans and do we see the need to counter the same? And secondly, the fact that this quarter the feature phone customer base has been intact. So are we gaining 2G customers from the market or from competition? Um, so I think the postpaid uh, business, I, mean, I will not comment on competition, but I will tell you that, uh, you know, as far as the postpaid business is concerned, uh, we've seen strong traction in the quarter. Uh, we saw an addition of 700,000 net ads. Uh, this came from, uh, I would say, two or three things. One is our omni-channel uh, capability. Close to 40% of our high-value acquisitions are now omni-channel, which is being, you know, where people are ordering online and it's getting delivered straight to the home. Um, and we have really perfected that model. The second thing that we have done is actually stepped up um, um, acquisition from some of our corporate customers uh, with this on the strength of our experience that we are delivering uh, we're seeing traction there uh, and the third part is uh, is um, uh, propositions along with the execution in the uh, at our stores which are really uh, um, you know something that we're very proud of in terms of the experience that we are broadly able to deliver through our customers who walk into those stores uh, as far as 2g is concerned uh, I think that um, you know, our, our, our net ads that we saw, um, uh, the, the overall net ads that we saw on 4G as well as uh, at an aggregate level uh, comes through a combination of people coming into 2G, people getting upgraded directly from 2G to 4G, which is our organic upgrades, as well as porting from, portents from um, um, uh, some of our competitors. So I think it's been an aggregate, uh, it's an aggregate story that, uh, that plays out. Thanks, Kupal. Uh, Harjit, the next set of questions are for you. Uh, people want to understand what are the timelines and quantum of divestment of the Infratel stake, if any plans at all at the moment? Sure. No, I think the merger is now uh, formally approved, including the uh, revisiting to the uh, deal situation that had to happen between the counterparties, uh, VPLC's lender's approval, and subsequent to that, even the NCLD final approval has been received last week. Uh, we expect in the next maybe 10 to 20 days, depending upon how the final reconciliations need to happen for closing adjustments, uh, the merger to be through. So immediately post that, I think this is where we need to evaluate the strategy for what could be the uh, final independent uh, tower coexistence model. Uh, in the shorter term, as you know, 37% will be owned by Airtel, 28% subject to all of these uh, 
screwed up for closing uh, will be owned by Vodafone PLC and uh, Vodafone India will be in cashed out for their shareholding in the Indus uh, business. So in any case, there is a sort of a diversified control, uh, senior independence in the way the uh, equity structure will look like as the combination happens. Uh, from where the stock price is and or factoring in what the realities of the markets are, uh, each sponsor may have their own view on monetizing at which point in time. Uh, thankfully, with the overall leverage situation for Airtel as a group, uh, which included a lot of equity injections that had happened till last quarter, uh, and also some of the equity-like instruments that we had done, the leverage of global Airtel, including Africa, is uh, sub-3 at about 2.9 turns. Uh, all of these segments are relevantly self-financing. So the leverage-driven monetization uh, trigger is not there. So I think it's more a business decision, more uh, also staying true to what the true value of the asset is. And as that shapes up, we'll come back to you on what the timelines for any monetization activities are. Otherwise, uh, the merged entity continues to serve each operator in the market. Thanks, Ajit. Uh, Gopal, the next set of questions is around 5G. Uh, what is our aspiration in the 5G landscape? And if you could provide some more clarity on the news around Bharti developing local 5G gear ecosystem by our own R&D and US Japanese partners. I think that, uh, you know, uh, we believe that the 5G um, uh, rollout in India is still a couple of years away uh, for various reasons. Number one is that the uh, ecosystem is still nascent. Device prices are still anywhere between $700 to $1,000. Applications are still being developed uh, because what really 5G gives you is incredible speed and a much lower latency. And, uh, you know, low latency applications are really industrial applications. And therefore, some of these applications are yet to be developed. The ecosystem is growing. Second reason is that uh, 5G spectrum prices uh, as far as the reserve prices recommended by TRA is concerned, are very high for us to be able to afford at these levels. And therefore, there is no business case uh, at, at these levels of, um, of spectrum, spectrum cost. Uh, what we have been doing over the last uh, couple of years is that we have invested uh, substantially in creating our own R&D team uh, based in Bangalore. Uh, this team actually works with uh, partners from around the world, software providers, hardware providers, chipset makers, um, uh, you know, companies that are based in the U.S. and some of the operators as well, uh, Japanese operators, um, European operators, um, as also hardware vendors, whether they're in Taiwan or, uh, or in Japan, uh, and software companies. Uh, and the reason that we do this is really for us to be able to uh, be a part of the ORAN movement. I think ORAN is truly game changing for uh, telecoms because in a way what ORAN does is it strips open the hardware and the software into two disaggregated layers. And through that process, uh, you would be able to bring down overall cost of CapEx. Um, the important thing in ORAN is to have interoperable uh, software uh, between the existing 4G networks and 5G. Uh, there are some markets in Europe and the US where through the X2 interface opening up on ORAN, uh, now it has become interoperable. Uh, we are examining this closely, as I mentioned in my speech. Uh, we are part of the ORAN um, board. Uh, we were the pioneer operators in India to actually run the global ORAN plug fest. All of this is our effort to really try and understand this ecosystem, be part of it and shape it. Uh, as a part of our ORAN effort, we have developed our own 4G small cells, indoor as well as outdoor, and commercially deployed them. Uh, these are all small cells that we've developed in-house using software provided by LTO Star, using hardware provided by CERCOM in Taiwan, and kind of configured it together to bring together a solution that is uh, plug and play and that can actually operate in any network provided by any equipment provider. Uh, and I think this is the precursor to what we would like to do even on 5G. So we are studying the space closely. That does not mean that our traditional partners like Ericsson and Nokia and the others will not be important. All of them will be as important. And we will work with every partner to really move towards ORAN and open up the interfaces so that we are able to get the uh, uh, able to actually have interoperable networks going forward. That's really what we're trying to do.
Thanks, Gopal. Uh, the next set of questions is around Airtel business. Maybe, Bagal, I'll request you to take these questions. Uh, could you provide some color on the YOY EBITDA margin expansion for Airtel business? And do you think it is sustainable? Um, yeah, I would say that um, uh, it's very important to look at the actual business on a sequential basis. If you look at the last four quarters, our EBITDA margins have been hovering around 37%, uh, and it's been fairly consistent uh, to my mind. If I were to look at YOY, uh, one of the key challenges which we see in the first initial first two quarters is on account of bad debt, which we have been um, able to manage substantially better in the current uh, environment and the current year. So I would say that the current level of EBITDA margins and EBIT margins are fairly sustainable uh, for Airtel business. Thanks, uh, thanks, Patil. Uh, the next set of questions are from Vinay Agarwal, First State. Uh, uh, two things that he wants to ask. Firstly, Gopal, why can't we take the lead on tariff hikes? And secondly, what are the top three things that uh, you know you're spending most time on at the moment? Uh, I, I was already mentioned that you know we have already in a way taken the lead because we are at a premium. So if uh, you know we see we see movement of other operators getting to uh, you know levels uh, that are equal to us, we'll again take a premium, and that'll be a good way to you know for us to take it up. So we would not want to do anything to jeopardize our intrinsic competitiveness. I think in the telecom space, uh, you can have a premium, especially if you're delivering a, a better service and if you're an aspirational brand. But beyond a certain point, the premium will become unsustainable. And we think we've got a sweet spot, so we don't want to risk any slowdown in momentum um, by, by moving pricing at a time when it is, it is uncompetitive. So we want to be competitive, but we would welcome a change in tariff and we would follow immediately. Um, what was the second uh, part to the question, Komal? Uh, Komal, the question was, what, were the, what are the top three things that you're spending your time yeah, most okay. on? Okay. No, I think the, uh, I think the first uh, uh, thing that I'm spending time on is really uh, spending a lot of time on our digital approach, uh, particularly driving a integrated approach to thinking omni-channel, an integrated approach to thinking one home. One of the things that we have uh, launched recently, for example, is a one, Airtel, uh, a one Airtel plan, which brings all our services, mobility, postpaid, uh, DTH and broadband, into a single build with a dedicated relationship manager in a much more convenient way. And we've just rolled this out across towns now. We're seeing some solid traction. The only reason we've been able to pull that off is because we're thinking about the journeys in a completely digital and omni-channel perspective. And I think these capabilities are very important to see where Airtel goes in terms of its digital ambitions to truly build many more digital services which can deliver us meaningful revenues. So I think that's one area I'm spending a lot of time on. The second area I spend a lot of time on is on networks to really because that is the core of our experience. So when I say network, networks, I mean I'm using that as a as a as a shorthand for customer experience so networks as well as non-network experience in order to just get that right it's not that we are perfect we make a lot of errors there are structural issues it's a day in day out job to really get our networks better and the third part that i spend a lot of time on is on our people uh, really making sure that um, you know that the capabilities are built we're getting the right person in the right place uh, training them properly making sure that they are supported uh, smoothening out the fracture lines that typically happen in any organization and making sure that uh, these fracture lines are bridged. I do believe that as the leader of the team, one of my critical roles is to smoothen out the fracture lines and smoothen out the bridge so that we can move faster as a company to serve customers. So those are the three areas that I spend time on. Thanks, Gopal. Uh, the next question, uh, set of questions are from Rajiv Sharma. Uh, your net debt is 2.9 times net debt to EBITDA. What are the plans to bring it down? Uh, secondly, why are we not keen to have a global tech player as an equity or a strategic partner? And lastly, thoughts on any 5G spectrum options? Well, you want to take the other two first? Yeah, I'll take the other two first. So I think, uh, let me, I've already talked about the 5G spectrum. So uh, it is, uh, you know, we do believe that the spectrum price that has been indicated by TRAI uh, when it comes to the reserve price is 
uh, highly unaffordable for us and therefore we would hope that uh, these prices come down and at this stage with these prices uh, we will not be able to afford it. Um, when it comes to uh, you know a global tech player let me kind of just pull back a little bit. Uh, firstly I want to underscore that you know for us uh, partnerships are crucial. We work with everybody. Uh, we work with all the leading OTT players and not just the leading OTT players. We worked with uh, like you've seen on Airtel Secure uh, alliances with Cisco, Radware, VMware, Forcepoint. Uh, these are companies who are outstanding companies in their own right. We're working with Verizon uh, to actually pull together Airtel Blue Jeans. Uh, we have a lot of partnerships with Google. Uh, we've worked with Amazon to actually do um, AWS. We are one of the biggest partners for Netflix on content. So partnerships is something that comes to us naturally and we will work with everybody. The second question then is the role of capital from a partner. I think the role of capital is a different, is an independent decision and delinked from the role of how we work with partners. So when we wanted to raise money, we did go out and actually come to many of you and raise $8 billion over a few weeks to a combination of a rights issue, a perpetual bond and a QIP. Uh, and so when you when we need capital, we know how to raise capital. But equally, we know how to work with partners and we believe that it is it is a win win for us to work with partners because the business that we are in is an ecosystem business. We have to work with partners. So that's really the way I would I would see. Arjit, over to you. Thanks, Gopal. Uh, I think uh, the question of net debt to EBITDA is relevant, but there are two, three underlying drivers we have to see. Uh, if you see the overall net debt today, uh, if we put together Africa as well, about 50% of the net debt is really a DOT deferred spectrum liability, which also includes the AGR uh, liabilities that have come over after the judgment came out. So real external debt is 50% uh, of 2.9. Of that 50%, uh, another 20% is entirely the finance lease obligations. I'm not saying it's not debt. It is intrinsically built into your lease payouts for tower companies that are serving you. So between DOT and FLO, 70, 72, 73% of our global debt uh, sits. So external lenders debt is about 28 to 30%, of which 20% is uh, global bonds, long term, dollar, euro, India, NCDs, rupees. Really there is a, a stability of existence, there is longer tenure ahead. Only about 8 to 10 percent thereby is balance bank debt could be short term across the various countries in Africa uh, and of course some bit in India. So that's part one. I think the leverage is number one, but the breakout of leverage does give you the comfort to be able to uh, feel okay about how the split is. 50 percent DOD, 20 percent FLO, very broad thumb rule of the balance 30 percent, 20 percent is in bond debt and 10 percent in, in sort of bank debt. Second piece is net debt to EBITDA is a function of both net debt and EBITDA. I think if you go back six to eight quarters, our EBITDA, specifically in mobile India, was going through a reasonable stress time, and since then life has changed. So if you put together the combined EBITDA, which is close to 12,000 crores this quarter, it was about 63, 6,500 crores about 12, 14 quarters ago. So that's the sort of spread up, and if the tenacity of that across the businesses be it Africa, be it mobile India and be it non-mobile India continues, whatever the percentages you may impute, this will automatically come down thereby. So with that in, in view, there is no specific requirement to have uh, net debt specific initiatives, albeit you will have some time or the other uh, further proceeds coming in for Carlyle infusion. You will have some time or the other tobacco monetizations. Africa as a unit does send us uh, dividend. Infratel after the merge go will have more dividends coming out. So there is some auto deleveraging built in there too. Thanks, Ajit. A related question which many investors have asked us is around the conversations with rating agencies. If you could also update in the same way, uh, vein around the conversations with uh, s and Moody's and Fitch. No, I think ratings have been stable. Uh, the the fundamental operations uh, uh, risk, which historically had remained high, and a strong regulatory overhang of what really is the outcome of the situations and how is that dealt with with the operating unit in terms of debt and equity mix. All of that is actually uh, reasonably well taken care of. Uh, it's of course 
Uh, everyone demands a little more in terms of how the sustainability works, what could be the increases on tariffs, etc. But directionally, we just talked about the EBITDA increases. We talked about over the last 12 to 15 months, 60 to 65,000 crores worth of uh, capital reorganization around equity, equity likes, and uh, some bit of debt refinancing or perpetual. So that has actually helped. Uh, the stimuli at work are really the uh, India sovereign rating. And there was one of the rating agencies actually looked at India sovereign rating, changed the outlook, and that has changed something for us. But otherwise, at this stage, uh, we feel we are working towards all of the parameters they have set to stay in the triple B minus category. Uh, we should be sustainably sitting there. Uh, Africa, by the way, should over time, if not now, three, four, six quarters, should have their independent rating. And that could also mean independent financing track for themselves. Uh, so at this stage, fairly comfortable. Thanks, Ajit. Uh, next set of questions are around subscriber edition. Gopal, perhaps you'll have to take uh, take these. Uh, so the questions are that was there a support from pent up demand in smartphone availability or porting requests, which have helped the 4G edition this quarter? And how do you think about focus on customer acquisitions and market share versus profitability? And uh, in the same vein, what is the outlook for smartphone shipments and sales looking uh, as far as next quarter is concerned? Uh, okay, I think that, uh, um, you know, I think that we saw a big slowdown in shipments in quarter one. Um, but I think in quarter two, the shipments have come back. I think July and August were about 30 odd million shipments. And my own sense is that maybe September would have been another 14 to 15 million shipments, so it could be 45 to 48 million shipments, uh, smartphone shipments. Um, and so what was an impact in quarter one was clearly something that caught up in quarter two. I think that is one thing that uh, that we did see. Um, if I look at our own performance, uh, what I would say is that, you know, um, what is it that is actually driving our performance? I think the focus on really going after quality customers and giving them a great experience, I think is the cornerstone of what's helping us um, deliver what we are doing. Um, come back that with the fact that we have a really aspirational brand and that we are, have a strong sales and marketing machine that can that uses data very powerfully to identify those customers who have propensity to switch, upgrade, and then target them, I think is really the entire um, menu of things that we that we look at. During the period of the lockdown, I think the role of the network and the role of the experience that you deliver has become even more important than before. And I think in hindsight, that has played well for us because we are a business that is always focused on delivering a superior experience, a differentiated experience, a better experience on various dimensions. And I think that's come home to actually help us uh, through the quarter. So that's the way that, uh, uh, that I see that. That as far as the current quarter is concerned, uh, the subscriber edition numbers that we have seen, are they coming more from competition or are these new SIM editions in the market itself? And secondly, uh, uh, you know, another question from Varun Ahuja is, what will be the impact on our financials when integrated goes to zero? And what will be the impact on financials? The what integrated charges go to zero. I see, okay. No, I think the uh, the you know it's been a combination of things. So I think uh, our net ads is firstly our overall revenue earning customers. Net ads is obviously customers that have come from a combination of uh, you know switch from competition as well as new customers coming onto the network. I think uh, you know it's both. Uh, India has a fairly high penetration of mobility, as you know, and therefore customers coming into mobility for the first time. I would imagine are in the ballpark of 30 to 40 million a year. Um, so we we have seen a combination of some customers who are new to the category, but also customers who have switched from other uh, from our, from our competitors. Um, when it comes to uh, um, the second question was on the on the subscription on the subscriber. Uh, what was that, Komal? The second question. The second question was on interconnect charges. Kopal, going to zero. Interconnect charge. No, I think that uh, I mean I think that this is now we're more or less at an on an equal footing on interconnect across uh, uh, different operators. So uh, we we are we welcome now the the move to actually do away with interconnect. I don't think it's going to have any material impact at all. Sure. 
Just switching gears a little bit, Gopal. Sorry, there, was uh, one, one, one question, sorry, I, there was one question prior that, that uh, was about how do we trade off between uh, acquisition and profitability. Uh, just to make it clear, I personally think that there is really no trade off. Uh, I think this is a business of scale. Uh, if you get more customers, if you deliver more revenues, uh, you do end up actually having uh, a, a, better, um, uh, a better shape of the PNL and uh, a more profitable business. So that is the nature of telecom, as you know, in every part of the world. Uh, the, the, you know, the, the, the leading players, number one, number two, typically make uh, more margins than the three, four, and five players in any market. Of course, India has only three players, three private players in a large market like India, and therefore it's a very, very good industry structure. So uh, I don't think there's a trade-off. Having said that, uh, we will obviously not do anything to, uh, to um, um, you know, anything silly in terms of how we look at it, because the business also must be seen longer term. What I have learned is that actually it's it's difficult to gain market share. It's much easier to lose market share. And once you lose market share, then you start losing scale. So I think market share becomes an important barometer to determine ultimate profitability. And uh, while we keep a close eye on cost and stripping out waste, I think scale is as important. Thanks, Gopal. Switching gears a little bit, our next set of questions are on the non-mobile business. Uh, the question which is being asked is that the digital TV business has shown muted growth despite high capex. When do we expect the growth jump to come? Uh, similarly, when do we expect the growth jump to come on the home broadband side? I think that uh, the DTH, so let me talk about home broadband first. I think the good news on the home broadband front is that we have started adding customers. So at 129,000 net ads, uh, clearly this business is starting to see traction in terms of uh, growth and penetration. And like I mentioned, September has been a strong month. And therefore, I think uh, we should see this traction continue uh, going forward, given the growth in work from home, growth in online education and streaming, as well as uh, an adjustment downward of pricing. That said, I think the full impact of the price drop is not yet showing up in this quarter's results, and that will come through in uh, in the subsequent quarter. I think ARPUs is uh, you know will be a little bit under pressure because of this pricing correction, uh, but we are okay with that because at the end of the day, if we, once you get more customers, I think that is the is really where the the business needs to be focused. And I do believe that the time for home broadband has come in terms of uh, driving penetration on DTH. Uh, we've added a strong customer base of 549,000 net ads. It's not entirely showing up in revenue, and Badal can explain that uh, in a minute. But again, we are pleased with the progress that we made on DTH, uh, adding more than half a million customers. And primarily, that is because of uh, the fact that we've been able to synergize our distribution systems between mobility and DTH. Mobility has a distribution system that's almost 20 times the size of DTH. Uh, and in places like Bihar, UP, Rajasthan, and uh, many markets, uh, we are getting a significant synergistic effort by actually finding the right model to synergize, but yet keeping enough focus on the DTH business. Um, just to add on what Gopal said, that we have added close to 550,000 customers in the current quarter. Most of these acquisitions have come towards the later part uh, of the quarter. And also, historically, July and August are softer months, uh, typically, in terms of recharges, in terms of uh, customers being online. So we have seen attraction which has come picked up in the month of September. And um, uh, I, we feel that that, sh that uh, traction should continue and it will go to yield results in the forthcoming quarters. <clears throat> Thanks, Padal. Um, Gopal, two set of questions again. Firstly, has there been any further discussion with the regulator as far as flow price uh, of data is concerned? And secondly, are thoughts on launching an affordable, low-cost smartphone? Um, I think that, uh, you know, um, the, we, we, there's a new chairman at TRAI. I mean, uh, he's just taken over, so I think we've just got to give him some time to settle and, and take a look at this. I think the industry has, uh, has uh, uh, through CAI, has asked for a intervention on floor price. Uh, let's see where that goes. I don't want to comment about uh, about that beyond uh, beyond what has been what CAI has already said. Uh, when it comes to a low cost smartphone, I think we've seen the announcements of one of our competitors uh, trying to develop a low cost smartphone. Uh, we're studying the space. Uh, we believe that uh, you know devices is. Uh, 
the good news in India is that uh, is that device distribution has remained separate from um, telecom distribution. And I think that's a good thing because the added cost of actually distributing devices to a telco networks is very high. Uh, the second good news is that by and large, uh, you know, over the last 20 years, uh, Indian telecom has stayed away from device subsidies by and large. And I think that again is a very, very good thing because if you see uh, the PNLs of some of the other um, other telcos in other parts of the world, subsidy has been has been quite a bane for most of the industry. And now they're beginning to peel back from those subsidies because you're incurring costs to stay pretty much in the same place. Um, the the third thing I would say is that the current economics of the industry do not permit you to actually do any form of subsidy. Uh, that all of that said, I think we are watching the space carefully. We are we have a team looking at this. And we haven't quite decided what our approach is, uh, but we're studying this very, very carefully to see um, what is really important for us is that we continue to get traction on converting 2G to 4G. That is a that's a North Star metric that's very important to us. And so we will look at it very carefully. <clears throat> Thanks, Kapal. Uh, the next set of questions are from uh, Rohit Chodia and a few others. Uh, hypothetically, if a 5G spectrum option were to happen next year and competition bids aggressively, will that make us change our stance and bid as well? And secondly, with data usage per customer showing signs of stabilizing, does the pressure on networks ease a bit? And what does this mean for LT capacity capex? What does it mean for? 4G capacity capex, 4G LT capacity capex. Um, so I think, uh, you know, like I said, I think if there is a, we are hearing from the uh, from the uh, department that there may be an auction uh, early next year. So in, you know, anywhere between January to March time frame. If in that auction, the reserve price of 5G is as high as it is, which is close to for 100 mega, you need a lot of spectrum on 5G, you need at least 100 megahertz to run good 5G networks. Otherwise, you'll get if you have small slugs of spectrum, the experience that you will get will be no different from 4G, and it doesn't make sense then to actually roll out 5G. Uh, for many reasons, including the devices being what they are, the ecosystem and applications being uh, nascent, and the fact that the spectrum prices where they are, we will uh, we will not we will not buy it at these prices because we won't be able to afford it. And so, if uh, uh, you know, I, mean, I don't I can't comment on what others will do, but for from our perspective, it will not make sense. Um, I think that when it comes to uh, data usage, uh, the the growth in uh, in data traffic is a function of both uh, increase in the average consumption per user as well as the number of users that come in. Uh, we do believe that we saw or we, we did see a significant surge in data payloads in quarter one as people work from home. The good news, of course, was that the pattern of the traffic changed somewhat because it was more steady traffic. And so the curve that we see uh, actually flattened out. Uh, you know, in telecom, the investment that you make is for the peak usage of the curve. So if it's a 24 hour day, the investment that is made is for the peak hour of that day, because that's where the experience cracks. What we saw in the lockdown was that the curve flattened out. And as a consequence, we were able to sweat the assets uh, much, much better because you had a more flatter curve. Uh, I think as lockdowns have eased, the data continues to uh, be at the levels where they are. They came down a bit and then kind of started climbing a little bit, not as much as what we saw earlier, but the curve has begun to kind of move away from that flat, flatter curve to the old historic curve. And so there is a need for some capacity investments. Uh, we believe, however, that um, you know going forward, if the structure of pricing is what it is, then you will still see some people blow through their allowances and go all the way to the uh, to the maximum that you give them. And that is what leads to, uh, you know, more and more data consumption. But I would say that the the impact of the increase in consumption on an average basis is going to be lower now from here onwards than what it was in the past. Thanks, Gopal. The next set of questions are from GV Giri. Uh, how has the SCNA come off despite gross ads being two times quarter on quarter? Uh, secondly, do you see content being a major player or a major differentiator in mobile telecom in the next few years? 
And lastly, uh, on the AGR matter, is it done and dusted, or could there be a possibility of an appeal? Uh, so on the SGNA, I think uh, you know the reason the SGNA uh, is looking uh, lower is because um, you know simply of the way that we we have we show uh, bad debt or provision for bad debt uh, on the B two B side, where a lot of the collections actually uh, take place in uh, in quarter two, and and therefore you know the the underlying SGA may not be. As representative, so it was, it, it, you know, it, that that's the primary reason. Uh, on the content side, uh, I think that uh, personally, I think that you know, content can be a differentiator, um, but it can be a differentiator only if one player has the content. I still haven't seen compelling evidence to suggest that. Uh, general entertainment content is a strong differentiator. I haven't seen compelling evidence of that. <clears throat> but I have seen in some cases um, topical events being a differentiator, for example, sports. Um, so I think uh, we will need to actually play this game carefully. One of the things that we've done with, uh, with the deal with Disney is that we have bundled together uh, you know, Disney and uh, Hotstar into our packs, but we've priced it up accordingly as well. And actually that's what worked quite well for us through this quarter. Um, on, on your last point on AGR, I think the Supreme Court has uh, has rendered its verdict. Uh, there are a couple of clarifications that we need to seek from DOT in terms of payment terms and things like that, uh, which we are in the process of uh, trying to understand and determine. But beyond that, I'm not going to be able to comment anymore uh, because we're still uh, still awaiting that clarity. Thanks, Rupal. Uh, Hajit, most set of questions are around our FPI, FTI approvals. If you could kindly update on the status of the 100% FPI approvals for Bharti Airtel, uh, and when can these come into effect as far as MSCI and some of the other indices are concerned? Right. So I think, look, uh, the process is on. Uh, as you know, the uh, company Airtel has its full approvals in place, but that also means that the subsidiaries below need to have their own approvals. And that while we see uh, nothing uh, extraordinarily uh, uh, to worry about, but has a process attached to it, uh, including for our DTH business, our other subsidiaries. So that's on including Airtel Payments Bank. Uh, we expect probably in the coming weeks and maybe two, four months max, uh, this should get completed, uh, actively at it though. Thanks, Ajit. Uh, the next question, Gopal, is on the 2021 Spectrum auctions. Uh, is there a need to bid, and what would be the potential outlays for the auctions coming due? I think we're still uh, assessing it. Uh, we believe that there is some need for us to complete our footprint of Spectrum in the sub gigahertz band, which has a lot of uh, advantage in indoor areas as well as in deep rural areas. Um, there is some of our 1800 band spectrum that is expiring. Um, we are going to look carefully at whether we need it or not, uh, because over time, the amount of spectrum that is being used for 2G is coming down every quarter. Um, and then there is, of course, capacity spectrum on the 2300 band. Wherever we need it, we might look at it. But uh, by and large, I would say, um, you know, our spectrum uh, in the mid band is, is uh, uh, spectrum holdings in the mid band is pretty strong. So um, it's the sub gigahertz and maybe some modest amount of capacity spectrum that we would uh, we would look to bolster. Thanks, Kapal. In the interest of time, I'll take one last question. Uh, there is uh, there are many questions which are coming through on Ghana uh, and the reasons for our exiting Ghana uh, without making any decent returns on our invested capitals. Perhaps I can request Nakul to comment on this. Yeah, <clears throat> I can do that, Kumul. As as you will know that the Ghana operations uh, have been in lock the last many many quarters. Um, you would also know that uh, uh, we actually did a merger with Tico in 2017, which unfortunately did not help in turning around uh, the business. Uh, in an effort to curtail the losses and post evaluation of all possible options, actually the board of the company decided to approve the conclusion of an arrangement with the uh, government of Ghana uh, to transfer the business on a going concern basis. Uh, to them. And uh, as of now, the parties are in advanced stages of discussion for the conclusion of this arrangement. And accordingly, uh, what you've done is you've taken a voluntary charge of about $25 million in the books in this quarter. Uh, 
Uh, we believe that this is a good news for the company because it will help us curtail our losses that we have already incurred in Ghana for the last many quarters. And uh, Ghana, as you know, is a 50-50 JV between us and Millicom. Thanks, Nakul. With this, I'd like to hand it back to Gopal for closing remarks. Uh, thank you, Komal. Thank you, uh, everyone, for joining this webinar. As I said, we've had a satisfying quarter. Our strategy of focusing on quality customers and providing them an exceptional experience remains fundamental to our uh, approach. At the same time, we are maniacal about morphing ourselves into a digital services provider by riding on our core strengths and building this virtual flywheel that I referred to. I see all this coming together to make Airtel more meaningful for customers than ever before. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for joining this webinar. A recording of this webinar will also be available on our website. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you.